Welcome everyone to this webinar of the 24-7 Carbon Free Energy Compact. The title of the webinar today is A Journey Towards Decarbonization and 24-7 Carbon Free Energy. Uh, we have with us two amazing panelists and also Professor Liang Ming uh, from Stanford University. is the Managing Director and Bits and Watts Initiative and the Net Zero Alliance. Um, as you know, the 24-7 Carbon Free Energy organized very regularly some specific webinars on topics that are 24-7 Carbon Free Energy related. And today we will do just that. And of course, one of the key objectives of the Compact is to raise awareness. And what is best, the raising awareness with two practitioners uh, on the energy sector that have very, very ambitious plans and objective ahead of them on decarbonizing uh, in the next uh, few years. And on this, I will give the floor to Professor Liang Ming to introduce our panelists and the topic of the day. Liang Ming, over to you. Thank you very much, Irina. So, I mean, as Irina said, in our quest for 24-7 energy future, it is crucial to highlight the extraordinary efforts of companies that are leading the change toward clean and the green future. So today we will shine a spotlight on Peninsula Clean Energy and the New Energy, two exceptional organizations committed to revolutionizing the energy landscape. The first, we have the Peninsula Clean Energy, a community choice aggregator that serves 21 cities and towns, actually including my community in the Bay Area. And then we will go to attention of New Energy, an organization spearheading groundbreaking initiative in Saudi Arabia. So uh, first, I'd like to introduce Jan Pepper, CEO of Peninsula Cleaning Energy. Jan has over 30 years of energy and utility experience, and uh, she became the first CEO in May 2016 and uh, built the Peninsula Cleaning Energy, the 24-7 go from the scratch, and they have the organization mission to deliver 100% renewable energy on 24-7 basis by 2025. Jan was elected to the Los Altos City Council in 2012 and served as mayor in 2015 and 2020. She served on the board of directors for Bay Area Air Quality Management District from 2013 to 2017. She is staff alumni and the bachelor and the civil engineering and uh, uh, MBA both from Stanford University. And uh, our another panelist is Dr. Jens Mandarin. Jens is executive director for energy for New, responsible for design planning and the building the world's most complicated and technology advanced 100% powered by renewable city from the scratch. Jens has more than two decades of experience in energy and the industry. He serves as a CFO at RWE Group, a German utility company, and the chief financial and the commercial officer at the Reactive Technology, a UK-based energy tech company. Jens served as a fellow at Oxford Martin School and a visiting scholar at the Stanford Precor Institute for Energy. He also served as a member for UK Accounting for Sustainability Advisory Council for His Royal Highness King Charles. Jens holds PhD and the MBA, both from University of Munster, Germany. Without further ado, I will hand the floor first to Jan Pepper to introduce Peninsula Clean Energy. Thank you, Ling, for the nice introduction. And thank you to everyone who's here to, to learn about what we are doing. So um, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, what I will cover today is kind of an introduction and background about Peninsula Clean Energy, and then talk about the modeling approach, the scenarios and assumptions we've made in achieving 24 seven renewables, what the results are, of that and how we're implementing it and just a general summary. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So Peninsula Clean Energy is a community choice energy program. And what that means is that we are the generation provider for all of the residents and businesses in the um, area that we serve. 
and we serve San Mateo County, which is the county directly south of San Francisco uh, here in the San Francisco Bay Area. We also are serving the city of Los Banos in Merced County, which is a little blue dot there and more towards the center of the state. And uh, overall, we have a 3,700 gigawatt load annually. The population we serve is about 810,000 with about 310,000 customer accounts. We have, um, actually we have three investment grade credit ratings. We just uh, achieved our third rating a couple of days ago. And um, since we started in 2016, we have delivered electricity to our customers at a 5% savings compared to PG&E. So Pacific Gas and Electric Company, also known as PG&E, is the investor-owned utility that serves this area of Northern California. So we replace PG&E in terms of the generation services. They still own the uh, poles and wires and deliver the electricity that we put on the grid uh, to our customers. So because we've had a discount um, from what people previously paid when they were PG&E customers, our customers have saved over $107 million since we started in 2017, 2016. So um, our goal is to be 100% renewable and to match our load with our supply on an hourly basis because we find that this significantly reduces greenhouse gas emissions and um, will also reduce the demand signal that the grid is getting to uh, generate power from fossil-based resources. So our goal is to show the way that you can do this, that you can do this uh, economically, that you can still save customers money and give them a cleaner and greener superior product. So next slide, please. In 2020, we uh, developed a strategic plan for our organization. And one of the organizational priorities was that by 2025, we deliver 100% renewable energy each and every hour of the day. And then also to focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions in buildings and transportation by 2035, which is 10 years ahead of the state of California's goals. Um, next slide, please. So in January of this year, we published a white paper on how we would achieve this goal of 24 seven renewables. And we've actually, I have an update on this. We will deliver 100% renewable on an annual basis by 2025, but due to forces in the market, we are going to achieve the time coincident basis, the hourly basis by 2027, just because of some of the delays in getting some projects uh, contracted. But still, that's uh, an ambitious goal. It's still faster than anyone else is doing that. And um, we'll get into more of those specifics. So if we go to the next slide, um, when, when organizations report out to uh, their shareholders or when we report out to the regulators that um, are regulating us in the electricity sector here in California, we report out on an annual basis. We have to report annually what are the uh, emissions from the electricity that we are serving. And in 2021, which was the last uh, published report, uh, the next one for 2022 will be coming out in the next month or so. On an annual basis, we reported that our emissions were five pounds per megawatt hour of CO2 equivalent. Um, and our supply is currently 50% renewable and 50% carbon free. So the, the carbon free is made up of large hydroelectric in our mix and the renewables is solar, wind, hydro uh, and geothermal energy and a little bit of biomass. Um, but if when we look at the supply that we're delivering um, on an annual basis, it looks great. But when you look hour by hour, what's the actual emissions content of that electricity, it's actually 222 pounds per megawatt hour CO2 equivalent. And that's because we get credited for excess renewables that we put on the grid during the summer afternoons when there's a lot of solar being generated. Uh, but then we're drawing from the grid, um, we're drawing from the natural gas fired power plants that are on the grid in the nighttime and in the early morning when there are not sufficient renewables. So that's what we wanna change. And the next slide is actually a, a heat map 
showing what the footprint is, our emissions footprint for our organization. And this was in 2021. Along the bottom axis, the x-axis is uh, the days of the year. So there's 365 days of the year across there. And then the y-axis is the hours of the day. So there's 8,760 pixels here representing every hour of every day. And you can see that in the summertime, in the, in the afternoons and in the evenings, there's sufficient renewable energy for us to be 100% renewable during those hours. But in the winter time and in the, the nights and early mornings, especially in the winter, we are drawing more from the grid and getting uh, less clean electricity at that time. So our goal is to make this, this heat map all green. And so how do we do this? So the next slide shows um, the steps. There's three steps that we're taking. So if we look at this graph here, the black line represents our load um, on average over the course of a year. And the, uh, the bottom axis is the hours of the day in a typical day. And then the vertical axis is the number of megawatts of resources we need to meet that load. So uh, the load is lowest uh, in the early mornings during at the night when, when people are sleeping, everyone gets up in the morning and then the load increases. It's pretty steady throughout the day. It then increases in the evening when people come home and cook and do whatever they're gonna do and then it goes down in the evening. And so currently the portfolio that we have, uh, we have geothermal as a base load resource there, the bottom uh, red strip. There's a little bit of small hydro, that light blue strip on top of it. The dark blue represents wind that we've contracted for. And then the solar is in the yellow. And you can see that the solar exceeds our load during the afternoons. And then there's a gray area where we're drawing um, energy from the grid because the resources that we have don't meet everything on an hour by hour basis. So we have enough renewables there to meet our the overall load, but the excess um, is is that we have during the summer afternoons or the the solar the solar from the afternoon we want to harness in a different way. So that takes us to the next slide, and what we're going to do is use energy storage to shift that renewable energy, store that excess renewables that is being produced in the afternoons, and then discharge that into the grid in the evenings so that we can replace that gray grid energy with stored renewable energy. And in that way, we can meet our load on an hour by hour basis. So we're contracting for lots of energy storage. And then ultimately, in the next slide, we also want to shape and shift our load on the demand side. So the dotted black line is the original load. The solid black line is the, the goal to shape and shift the load so for example, as more and more electric vehicles are on the grid, we want to encourage people to, to charge those vehicles during the afternoon when the excess renewables are there and to not charge them when they come home in the evening uh, in order to try to reduce that evening peak. So that will take a little, little longer. The impact that, that um, one can have on that is less because there's a whole bunch of small small loads that we're trying to change, uh, but this would be the goal uh, eventually. So if we go to the next slide, um, this kind of shows the, the modeling approach that we took here. So we developed a model called the MATCH model, uh, which stands for meeting, uh, I don't remember what it stands for now. <laughs> You'll have to look at our paper where we <laughs> define what it is, but it's basically matching our um, load and our supply on an hour by hour basis. It's a deterministic model, namely meaning that we put one set of inputs in, we get one set of outputs out uh, and run that model multiple times to try to come up with what is the ideal portfolio of resources in order to, for us to meet our 100% um, hourly goal. Um, we iterate on that lots of times. And then we also use another model called PowerSim uh, developed by a company 
uh, based in Colorado, Ascend Technologies, where we do st stochastic analysis, looking at what are the variables that, um, the other variables, like what are the extremes that could happen? And how do we make sure the portfolio is going to be dynamic enough to uh, meet extremes in energy prices or weather or, or whatever that may impact our portfolio? So we come up with an overall portfolio based on what we currently have in our, in our mix, um, based on uh, proposals we have received from developers to sell additional resources to us. So we have the, the resource mix, the technology, the price, what the uh, generation profile is for those resources, and put that all together to come up with an overall portfolio of what it is that we need to, uh, to meet this goal. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, the match model is open source and interested organizations can find that on GitHub. And uh, if you are interested in that and you wanna take a look at that, we're happy to, to help you figure it out. Um, just wanted to let people know about that. So let's go to the next slide. So when we did our modeling, we looked at a number of different scenarios. Um, our current portfolio over on the left side is meeting our needs with 100% renewables, but also having a lot of short-term renewables in there. And then we also looked at an annual 100% renewable by adding more long-term power purchase agreements. And then on top of the 100% renewable, we looked at different hourly scenarios. What if we match uh, the renewables 90%, 95%, 99%, and 100%? What does that do to um, the results? And you know, our goal is to, to match as much as possible. If we go to the next slide. We also looked at the market sensitivity scenarios. So we were doing most of this modeling in 21 and 22. In uh, 21, at the end of 21, the market conditions were were favor very favorable. Um, prices were were low, um, and that was our optimistic case. In 2022, the market had a lot of disruptions. The war in Ukraine really impacted power prices, made power prices in the market go go up. A lot of other dis market disruptions, such as supply chain issues. Uh, potential solar tariffs here in the United States. And so we have a conservative economic case as well to look at what the options might be. If we go to the next slide, um, the also when we're doing this time coincident matching, we end up having to procure more energy than we need on an annual basis. So as we um, add more and more resources, we we have this excess procurement and what are we going to do with that? So if we look at just an annual procurement, you know, we, we would procure to our overall annual load, but as we're looking at hourly matching, we need to procure more in order to match that load shape that we saw earlier. And so what we settled on was the 99% hourly where we are going to, um, see about 46% over procurement. So we have some other assumptions about that in, our, in the next slide, please. And so we need to resell that extra, those extra resources. And so our model, we, um, our model assumes that we will be able to resell the excess renewable energy credits and the excess resource adequacy by about 75% of that. So it may be better than that. Certainly we hope it would be, but, but this is kind of our conservative assumption um, as we look at what it's gonna to take to be able to do this. And the next slide shows the results. Um, what, what will be the cost of energy relative to what we're currently doing? And the, um, the blue lines in the graph show what the conservative case is. And so the, and the green, um, yeah. So, so the, on the left-hand side, far left is what our current portfolio is. And it shows that um, 
basically the conservative case shows that um, using our current portfolio, we set that at 100%. But then we look at how much more or less would it cost us to go to 100% or to, to more hourly matching. And when we look at the hourly 99% result, which is the second to the right set of bars, uh, we show that in the conservative case, it's 102% of what our current portfolio is. So it's really, we can do 99% time coincident at only a 2% cost increase compared to our current portfolio. And if prices were to come down and the market settles out, it's possible that we could even do this at a le less expense than what we currently have. Um, the optimistic market case is at 97%. But the interesting result here is that getting going from 99% to 100% in the conservative case, it, it jumps up to 112%. So it's like another 10% increase in cost for that last 1% of matching. So we decided we're gonna go for 99%. That that's not, um, it's not worth the extra cost to go to 100%, but you know, when we learn in, we learn in school, when you're at 99% and you, you round 99%, you're pretty close to 100%. <laughs> so we're okay with that. Uh, next slide, please. So this shows the new capacity that we need to add to our portfolio and you know, it needs, it increases as the time coincident target increases. And if we're going for our hourly 99% um, goal, uh, there's a lot of storage we need to add, which is the, the green bar on top, um, a lot of onshore wind, a lot of solar and uh, geothermal. We are also expecting in the long run, so this is kind of the 2025 scenario, in the long run, there will be some offshore wind available, which we expect to be available in California towards the end of the decade. So there'll be a mix of some short-term and long-term contracts so that we can um, use those short-term contracts for, for some, some portion of time and then uh, switch those out to other long-term contracts as new resources are available, such as offshore wind, other advanced storage technologies and things like that. And then if we look at the supply stack, the next slide kind of shows how the 99% scenario <clears throat> works out on a seasonal basis. So you can see in the spring and the summer, the black line of course is our load. And then uh, the resources are stacked there, geothermal in red, wind in blue, solar in yellow, storage in green. You can see in the summer, the spring and the summer, we have a lot of excess generation because in California, if we're not in a drought, there's a lot of hydro that's available in the springtime. Uh, of course, the sun is shining a lot more in the spring and the summer. But when we look at the winter time, that's kind of where the challenge occurs that you can see um, in the late evening hours that we're a little bit not quite meeting our load with the renewables um, for, the, for the winter nighttime and early morning hours. So that was kind of an interesting result to find out. Um, I'll try to, we're almost done here. If we look at the emissions reductions in the next slide, um, we see that the time coincident target will reduce our carbon emissions significantly. So the um, using the hourly 99% goal, we can bring our emissions down to 26 uh, pounds CO2 per megawatt hour. It's not zero because geothermal has some um, GHG emissions in it. And then if we go to the next slide, um, this is just a heat map showing in 2025, what would be the emissions intensity if we're doing only annual 100% matching. And we see that we would be at 155 pounds CO2. But then if we go to the next slide, when we're trying to do the 99% matching uh, with 100% renewable, we're down to 26 pounds CO2. And this was our goal to get this as green as possible. But we still see that, that the problem areas are the, the late night and early morning in the winter time. If we're able to contract for more geothermal, um, 
then we can we might be able to get this more more green all the way. So um, just to, to wrap it up, um, the reason the next slide. So we found that time coincident renewable procurement can be cost effective, and we are moving towards this. We're um, rapidly contracting for lots of resources, and in fact, tonight at our board meeting, we'll be asking our board to approve a contract for a large wind project being built in New Mexico, and um, that's part of our part of our goal to bring on all the resources that we need to meet this goal. And then um, the challenges and risks that we're facing, next slide. There's some uncertainty in being able to resell the excess renewables and the resource adequacy. We don't know what's going to happen in the market. We don't, there's always regulatory uncertainty. In addition to meeting our goal, we have to meet all, the, all of the requirements that the Public Utilities Commission uh, requires of us. We need to provide a reliable grid so that the lights stay on here in California. And also there's no official tracking system or accounting framework yet. Um, and so we're working to make sure that that's going to be available soon. Um, so that's, that's what I have. So we are demonstrating to the world that you can achieve reliable, affordable, 100% renewable every hour of every day. So I look forward to questions after Jens has made his presentation. Thank you so much for including me here today. Thank you, Jen. And uh, I would encourage uh, the folks online, I think people already started, uh, that you can submit uh, your questions through the Q&A function, the button. Then we will make sure we have about 15 or 20 minutes in the end are going to uh, cover your question. And then now let's move from California to Middle East. We'll have uh, Dr. Jens uh, Mandarin to share with us you know, his vision, how we build a 100% renewable city from the scratch. Yes, the yeah. is yours, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Liang. Uh, Jen, fantastic presentation. Um, I, I learned a lot and uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon or evening to where, wherever you are uh, over the globe. Uh, absolute pleasure to be here with you and share with you some thoughts um, uh, around how to design a 100% um, renewable energy system uh, from scratch. Um, next page, please. Um, so I would say um, from what Jen um, presented, a, a wonderful example on how you can optimize and get to a point um, where within an existing system, so within an existing frame, you're able to optimize and actually achieve 100% uh, uh, renewable energy, uh, which is fantastic. Um, a, a, lot of, a lot of changes and adaptions need to be made on that, but it is possible. What we have in NEOM as a setup is, is uh, about as opposite as it gets. Because what you look here, what you see on this slide is actually what we are looking at day, day in, day out. There literally is nothing. Or in trader's language, we are probably long sun, wind, and beautiful landscape, uh, and sand for sure, but we are short pretty much everything else. So um, instead of optimizing within a frame, ladies and gentlemen, we have a chance to set a frame. And that is probably what makes, from my perspective, NEOM a wonderful opportunity to show the world that you can run not just smaller scale areas or microgrids, but entire systems in an end game of way, way north of 100 terawatt hours, completely on the back of uh, renewable energy. Next page, please. So um, what we are focusing on is, is several aspects of NEOM. Um, but maybe just a, a couple of words on NEOM, on NEOM itself. So um, NEOM is an, um, one way of describing it. It's an, it's an economic free zone in the northwest of, of Saudi Arabia, right next to the Red Sea, um, roughly of the size of Austria or, or Belgium. Yeah? And um, being built from the ground, um, up 
as a, as a living laboratory. It's the largest clean infrastructure project worldwide uh, with a total capital expenditure of, of north of half a trillion US dollars. So just to, to uh, bring some perspectives in, a, a, a massive amount. Uh, also uh, being key to reduce Saudi Arabia's dependence on oil and gas and to diversify its economy towards solar, wind, and in particular, green hydrogen. Um, another way of seeing NEOM is a, is a hub for innovation uh, for entrepreneurs and business leaders and companies who will come to research, incubate, and commercialize clean tech innovation. You know, and for, for me personally, it's a, it's a bold dream. It's a bold dream, a vision of what a new future literally can look like and an accelerator of how we would frame it for change and human progress. And the core elements and pillars of the energy system you see here. So the, 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 uh, the goal is to achieve 100% renewable carbon, uh, uh, carbon free energy at lowest cost, obviously not at expense of security uh, of supply. Um, linked to that is a leading um, integrated uh, customer experience. We want to be able to uh, serve large energy intensive industries um, cleanly and actually take a lead, uh, leading role in this by um, building up and committing to the largest green hydrogen facility currently built worldwide. In particular, a challenge because in a 100% renewable world, um, the um, um, behavior of demand is one of the components, let's say, which needs to adapt a bit. You know, in a classical system, you would have the supply adjusting to the needs of demand. But in a 100% renewable system, even in a place uh, like Neom, you wouldn't be able to tell if the sun always shines or the wind always blows. So that flexibility required, you can obviously achieve by adding new assets and forms of storage and batteries and whatever way or form, it just adds to your ultimately LCOE, which we try to keep as low as possible. But demand behavior, understanding your demand and working your operations from different industry perspectives within this requires a pretty fundamental new way of thinking. And lastly, um, and you will learn a little bit more about it later on, without substantial innovation in the energy ecosystem, it's just not been possible. It's fair to say that in the past, we haven't been blessed in energy with a strive for innovation as other industries have. But I would say that the, the goal to achieve a 100% renewable place has actually uh, um, uh, uh, led us down that road and accelerated the push to apply innovation also from other sectors in the energy industry. Next page, please. So um, with regard to, to uh, NEOM, um, we are in that way truly blessed about the complementary wind and solar profile we have. So um, you see at the bottom um, bottom left a, a solar uh, solar profile worldwide. At the at the um, top left, um, wind speeds as an indicator, I guess, um, for uh, wind uh, power production. But you see very few places marked on the right with the stars. Who are blessed with both, and and Neom is just is one of them. So just to give you um, rough ideas, um, we are talking here wind speeds in some area, uh, some areas of Neom, uh, which leads to capacity factors of high thirties, low forties uh, percent um, at 10, 11 meters per second as a steady eddy base load, uh, base load wind profile, which is almost comparable to offshore uh, wind we at least uh, know in, in the North Sea or other places. Um, from a irradiation perspective, um, we are getting uh, in the, to the high 20s of capacity factor. So again, 
um, very favorable in that light. Um, to um, picture the growth of NEON, I would say that the larger part of the growth, so the further you push it out, it's ultimately been, been um, delivered by solar, which inevitably, which inevitably guides us to the question, what do we do in the off-peak? What do we do with the night power? And, and here, and I'll come to that later, we will, uh, we will see that currently we are using some of the existing flexibilities in, um, in legacy systems to overcome that. We use, for example, lithium ion as, as one technology uh, to be able to serve a 12 hour period. And here the answer is it's possible, but it's by far not economical. You need to come to different places. We call them long duration energy storage, which together with solar ultimately offers a place where you create, think about it like synthetic baseload or synthetic wind um, that will ultimately drive sustainable growth based on renewables, not just in NEOM or in Saudi Arabia, but actually um, later on worldwide. Next page, please. So this would probably fill an entire uh, two hour session on uh, what goes through your mind when you just set up something from scratch. And um, I can tell you from personal experience, it, it, in the moment, it sounds totally exciting. You can literally start shaping things in the way you always wanted to do. On the other hand, there is literally nowhere to hide. So you still need to produce power despite having large, uh, large ambitions. So, and here I just listed a few questions which we deal with um, and just to, to highlight some of the thinking uh, which, we are, which we are considering in setting up a market design and an, an, a wider, from a physical perspective, energy um, grid setup, which ultimately allows um, a 100% renewable system to perform at its best. So if you look at, at generation and markets, for example, right? Um, um, typically, um, efficient energy markets worked down to a dispatch model. So you dispatch first what's A, online, and B, cheapest form of of marginal cost, and then you go up your cost curve up to the point when you hit your demand, uh, which is great. Um, in a renewable system though, if your marginal cost, let's say for simplicity are zero or close to zero, you can't use that anymore. So in what way do you dispatch? Um, uh, you know, um, you automatically need to look out for, for other forms of ranking these um, and there are many, but it just requires, again, not same, same, same in a more efficient way. It's, it, it drives you to the question of effectiveness, rather thinking, rethinking about the frame and truly adapting renewable principles in your market design. Um, I also put um, um, quite deliberately here um, um, controversial questions on here with regard to um, do we need a retail competition, right? Says the one who loves competition and is a, is a deep, um, um, deep believer in competitive markets. Um, that said, having been exposed to, um, to my, um, uh, uh, to, to my uh, home country for, for decades, the UK, I'm not quite sure if retail competition really led to lowest prices, really led to best outcomes for customers. So at least we need to ask that rather difficult um, uh, question, right? And another point, which I'll come back later to is, so how do you balance that system with permanent intermittent power and decentral generation? It guides you towards the importance, I guess, of technology as a core ingredient to make it work. Next page, please. So um, I was speaking um, a few weeks ago at a conference which a number of um, non-energy experts, and I, I tried to explain to them 
gave them the analogy of how I believe um, technology is being disparate in different industries. And I use the car uh, for simplicity. So um, um, you will see here on the surface, a number of technologies being deployed in a way that it drives customer satisfaction. You have a better display, you have a more efficient engine reducing your fuels, uh, more customer comfort, better protection, et cetera, et cetera. So wonderful things, and they have all their right to do. Ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, you run your car on a diesel or petrol engine, and it has four wheels. So you haven't changed fundamentally anything. So, and then the uh, question came, so how, how would it look like in, in your head being clearly a non-automobile expert? And that's what you see on the next page. This is, this is how, how I think about an, the energy system of the future. Next page, please. Um, you see on the, on the left, I would say um, a, a representative um, picture of how structures are, are being set up. Um, without a doubt, you, you have um, a legacy infrastructure and around that, we'll try to build marginal improvements um, uh, to, uh, to consumers using marginal, um, um, let's say, di a digital layer putting on top, such as improved demand forecasting or predictive maintenance or things like that. So NEOM, in contrast, will be built around the digital core. So it puts the digital platform right at the center. So without um, digital technologies, we cannot build a 100% renewable energy-based system from scratch. That is our, our deep belief. All parts of the energy um, value chain, so such as uh, generation, transmission, distribution, retail, will be put on top of a connected data layer to enable ultimately a 100% renewable-based energy system. And you can only come to that if you ultimately change the way how things are being done and, and accept, I would say, also one cultural change, which is probably the hardest um, for energy experts worldwide, is to allow to unlearn. So past experience, and I had to learn this myself the hard way, is not always the best guide to designing the future when you're setting a frame. Listening to other sectors and experiencing and trying to bring crossovers um, into the energy industry from further developed uh, sectors, it's a skill which is much more needed and this in this fundamental transition phase. Next page, please. So, and this is maybe one way of, of how, you can, how you can see this working. So um, uh, to enable a, a real-time optimization, consumption and generation data needs to be available on real-time basis and make informed decisions, um, not just for tomorrow or when, but literally in the here and now. Um, established energy systems have data silos. So typically each part of the value chain operates to some distinct differently to the others. Um, it's partially driven by um, efficiency scalings um, uh, regulators hoped to achieve and they did, but the decoupling has obviously a, a, a number of negative consequences as well. So NEOM's digital energy platform will have a shared and integrated data lake across the value chain, connecting operational and digital activities. So, and take this as an illustrative um, guidance on the right. So for example, we, you, would, you would describe it as a cloud layer, I guess, um, that provides scalable solutions to connect with all assets in the energy value chain from production all the way up to retail, a data layer that stores, manages, and secures all data um, from the energy supply chain, enablement layer that runs intelligence such as, uh, such as analytics and real-time asset optimization through technologies um, such as artificial intelligent internet of things or, or virtual reality. 
and maybe at the at the very bottom um, um, a marketplace uh, layer that offers various applications and capabilities to the outside world for example white labeling selective um, energy market data to companies in other sectors who may want to use that data for completely different purposes it just maximizes the use of data not just as an economic business model in its own right but also as a core requirement to be able to achieve stability and securely delivering a 100% renewable based energy system next page please so this is really a page I took when I went nearby Oxford and to an elementary school and tried to explain to them in the simplest way or form of how it feels to be part of NEON. So in a way, there are parts where I would say you have a pretty good idea and you start painting. So that's the darker picture of the slide. Um, and then you sort of have a clue, but you run a little bit out of ink. Um, but at least you feel still somewhat comfortable. Um, the drama becomes um, when you even don't know, when you even run, don't run out of ink. So you still have some color left, but you really can't use it because you don't have a clue. Um, and the worst thing is that there are probably many things out there which you don't know that you don't even know them yet. So the, the journey for Neon is one of exploration. It's one of innovation. It's probably also um, in, in, in certain areas, one of fast failures and learning from them. Um, what we are trying to achieve is not an, a kind of an island solution in a smaller scale, but showing that you can run an entire system north of 100 terawatt hours based on renewable energy. But I think the mentality and the right culture for this need to be part as well, including sufficient humbleness, I would say, not to believe that you can do it on your own. So we work together with numerous constituents, um, not just within Saudi Arabia or the Middle East. Actually, we work closely with um, Liang and his team together in, in Stanford, uh, with other teams here at, at, um, in my home, uh, hometown in, in, at Oxford University, but also with, with large uh, technology companies, all chipping in to make sure that uh, we can turn that dream which we're all having into reality by 2030. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you, Jens. I think we already have a piled question on, uh, on the Q&A. And as next step, I will handle the Q&A and also the moderate conversation to Nora Lee. Thank you so much, Leon. And how interesting are the presentations? I really had a fun time listening to the results. Um, okay, so we have about 10 minutes for questions and answers. And for those of you who have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A, that little button on the bottom of your page uh, to post your questions and we can try to go over them one by one. And for now, I have a list of very good questions. Um, the first one, I will direct it to um, Jen. Uh, the question is, how do you see India as a renewable uh, super hub as we targeting 500 gigawatt by 2030? Off to you, Jen. Um, I think it's really um, important for India to be a renewable super hub because there's so much demand there and there's such a need to um, move towards renewable technologies. So I think it's um, super important for, for India to move forward. I'm not quite sure um, how, how that would be done. I'm not too familiar with what, um, how energy projects are done in India, but it, it seems like India with the largest population in the world is a really key player in moving us all towards a sustainable future. I'm not sure I answered the question, but <laughs> happy to elaborate more if there's more uh, more detail. 
Thanks. Yeah, especially also with the Indian play a big part. They can, you know, feel uh, share all the technology and lessons learned with the rest of the world can also be some, you know, part of that. Okay, and um, let's move on to the next question. This one is for you, Jens. Um, so along your um, journey towards decarbonization, have you engaged and collaborated with local stakeholders, businesses, and residents to, to drive the trans, uh, transition towards clean energy and 24-7 CFE? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, um, I mean, transitionary change never works if you do that to your stakeholders you need to deeply uh, in, embed them in their journey of change and engage with them to almost come up with the targets uh, with them with them together. In particular, think about the, the situation in Saudi Arabia where we are transitioning from uh, probably the country most famous for, for oil and gas towards a place where, where Neom at least is a, is a lighthouse towards uh, wind, solar, and and green hydrogen and other green fuels. So um, the other part, I guess, is that um, we are uh, basing a number of our um, activities on partnerships where we bring in uh, not just um, businesses uh, and companies from the uh, from the wider Middle East region, but from across the world. So, um, for example, our um, our um, green hydrogen project is, is a is a joint venture uh, between Neom and, uh, and um, Air Products and Aqua Power. So, um, bringing different sort of uh, complementary skill sets together to try to achieve and work on it. We in Neom give the platform, but as I said before, we are never intended to do it on our own. And a large part of that success will be driven by, by partnership and deep stakeholder engagement who are bought into this journey towards 100% uh, renewable future. Thank you, Jens. Um, okay, we have another question for Jen. Um, is the model you developed open source and how do you track and monitor your heat map. Is there a 24-7 CFE matching software that you use for? Um, yes, the answer to the first question. So the, the model is open source and you can go to a website called GitHub, G-I-T-H-U-B, GitHub slash Peninsula Clean Energy and find the model there. Um, and then as far as how we, um, I think the question was how did we, um, generate the heat map, the emissions heat map. So uh, basically what we did was we took the hourly generation for the resources that we have right now, and we used the um, California Public Utilities Commission clean system power calculator to convert the monthly, um, to, to use that to, to calculate what was the hourly generation. And then we could come up with what the uh, emissions were in each of those hours. So it's not really a, um, uh, it's not specifically made for that, but but we use that existing um, system, the the CPUC clean, clean system power calculator. And then um, if, if there was a, an hour where we didn't have enough resources ourselves and we were drawing from the grid, then we use the emissions factor that the California independent system operator had for that hour. So we drew from different places and, and put that into this uh, clean system power calculator. Thanks for the detailed explanation. That makes sense. Okay, moving on to the next question for you, Jens. Um, what new technology we can add to remote load dispatch centers? Uh, yeah, that's the question. So um, I, I, would, I would answer it probably in two ways. One is in NEOM, we have in particular two huge demand centers. So um, this is the line itself and Oxagon, which is the industrial hub. 
and they probably account for 90% of the total demand. So for the 10%, um, we ac actually operate in, in microgrid mode, yeah? So, and here, um, as well as for, the, for serving the larger demand, we face the same problem. In a way, you could say we run out of wind after some period of time, at least on a, on a highly efficient basis. You will still get uh, wind at 25 or 30 percent capacity factor, but our, um, our solar is unbeaten. So and the best way to solve that is uh, well, well, we are doing a, a, a larger in investment program around uh, long duration energy storage. So really finding a way how to be able to store energy um, for the entire night and the shoulders to be able to smooth them out uh, off peak demand. And um, that is an area which hasn't been explored yet in sufficient depth. And the simple reason is because everyone is still getting away with a number of existing legacy flexibilities um, in their systems. We, we, as you saw from my first picture, there, there is no legacy. So I, I really can't rely on it. Hence, we need to start investing larger scale in these type of technologies and driving costs down. And the best thing is that this just doesn't um, come as a benefit ultimately only for NEOM, but also for the for the wider planet, um, as as you would expect. Yes. Thanks, Jens. Okay, we have about time to ask another question, and uh, I'll give this one to you, Jen, and just quickly, please. Um, so, to reach twenty four seven CFE ninety nine percent at Peninsular Clean Energy, what proportion megawatt uh, and technology are you using for storage? What technology are we using for storage? Mm -hmm. um, so right now we're relying on lithium ion storage because that's what's available in the market. Um, we're, and we have um, some four hour lithium ion storage facilities. We've also contra contracted for some eight hour longer duration storage. We're looking at a compressed air energy storage uh, facility that um, hopefully we'll be able to, to do. And um, I mean, I would love to see other types of storage technologies out there because the lithium ion isn't, isn't the best. I mean, there's a lot of environmental issues with lithium ion and, you know, what is the disposal situation going to look like for that? But that's what's out there right now. And that's what's the, the least expensive. But just as Jen said, storage is key for all of these things is because the, um, the renewable energy is produced at certain times of the day, which may or may not match the load. So having storage, long duration storage, having um, um, you know, low cost storage is, is important. So we're looking at flow batteries. Uh, there's also pumped hydro. There's other interesting technologies like um, there's a gravity storage uh, technology that we've seen. All of these are, or a number of these are still in um, kind of piloting mode, and hopefully there'll be a lot of uh, advancement and the cost for those types of storage technologies will come down. Thank you so much, Jen. And to be conscious of time, we are going to wrap up the session now. Uh, if you have any remaining questions that's not answered, please feel free to send them to uh, energycompact at seforall.org, and we'll try our best to uh, to, to direct the questions to our speakers. Um, thank you. I want to say a big thank you to Liang for bringing this webinar to life. And thank you everyone here for your great questions and being part of this workshop. Um, I would like to also express my deepest appreciation to Jen and Jens for sharing your very valuable insights and lessons learned from the transition towards 24 seven CFE. Okay, so as we conclude today's workshop, let us just remember that this journey towards decarbonization and 24-7 carbon-free energy is a collective effort. Each one of us has a vital role to play in driving this transition to a cleaner and greener future. And of course, by leveraging the power of carbon-free energy. Um, so for, signature, uh, for signatories here with us in this uh, session, I strongly encourage you to take advantage of our com uh, the community platform 
and start your partnerships by initiating conversations with your peers uh, using the message function. And as usual, if you have any questions, reach out to us. And for all, those, uh, all of you guys who are new to 24-7 CFE, if you would like to learn about how to join us, uh, please reach out to us by sending an email, again, to energycompact at seforall.org, and one of us will get back to you. Finally, uh, just a reminder, uh, as Elena said at the beginning of the session, the recording uh, and the slide decks for this event will soon be uploaded to our website, which is gocarbonfree247.com, and you can find it on the news and events page. Again, I just want to thank you everyone for joining us today. And uh, we really look forward to uh, the continued progress and collaboration in our collective pursuit to uh, decarbonization and 24 seven CFE. Have a great rest of the day and uh, goodbye everyone for now.